Hope 365, as you know, is a 501c3 nonprofit organization. It's dedicated to improving the lives of women and girls locally, nationally, and worldwide by advocating for their safety through raising awareness, education, and empowerment. Our focus, though, is on ending harmful practices against women and girls, such as child marriage, female trafficking, and menstrual restriction. Another for it is Chalpadi, and that's in Nepal. There are two very special sponsors that I want to thank, especially thank today, because they've been with us since inception, supporting monthly and as needed. Uh, Daryl Sheets, who's uh, the uh, counsel for Global Hope 365 with the offices, uh, with the law offices of Daryl C. Sheets, and Ray Cordova, chair of South County Labor who's without their support, we will not be able to continue raising awareness and saving lives day in and day out. Thank you so much. I would also like to thank our board members, Gus Tubia, Tamara Farah, Lisa <laughs> Withers, Kristen Manna, and Dot Leach. Thank you also to our summit gold, uh, gold sponsor, Ira Capital, Mahanad Balas. Thank you so much. You've also been there for us. Uh, this event would not have been possible without the support and countless hours put in uh, and to make it uh, viable. Elizabeth Sutan, one of our supervisor, uh, survivors and a professional facilitator, she introduced us to Nancy White, Maggie Chumpley and Paul Tevis. We have today Maggie and Paul and Anna Bryan from our team. Thank you all so much for all your hard work. I would also like to mention to please consider donating to fund our ongoing programs and campaigns to raise awareness and save lives by ending child marriage and preventing human trafficking. The link is in the chat. And Kristen Manna, our board member and director of development is here to help you answer any questions that you may have. You can privately message her in the chat and there's also still room to be a sponsor today. So let her know. Since 2000, we know from the July 22nd a summit that we had, well over 200,000 minors were married. In the US, most of them girls married to adult men. You know, children lack the rights and resources of adults. We heard that through the stories, the heart-wrenching stories of the four survivors that are also with us today. As a result, many child marriages are forced marriages and or cover-ups for statutory rape and other abuse and exploitation. Marriage before the age of 18 has devastating lifelong consequences, including greater vulnerability to sexual and domestic violence, increased medical and mental health problems such as maternal and infant mortality, higher dropout rates from high school, close approximately 50%, dropping out from college, greater risk of poverty. Uh, and we heard from one of our survivors that she ended up being on the street and she had to go to uh, the abusive, back to the abusive um, husband in order to be able to protect her kids. And, and the divorce rate is up to 80%. 13 states have no minimum age to marry, including California, where parental consent and judicial approval is required, along with a 30-day waiting period that is waived if the young girl or if the minor is um, pregnant. Alaska and North Carolina have a minimum age of 14, and four states have a minimum age of 15. It is now my pleasure and honor to announce our survivors, the ones who are with us here today. Genevieve Meyer, Survivors and with the Res Resiliency Foundation, Elizabeth Sitton, Sarah Tasneem, Survivor and Advocate, Sarah Tasneem Advocacy, uh, Don Tyree, Survivor and Advocate. And of course, our special guest that I would like to point out, uh, Janet Abbott Wicker, candidate for City of Orange, District 3, Ray Cordova, Chair, South County Labor, Melissa Fox, Council Member, City of Irvine, Peggy Wong, Deputy Attorney General, Department of Justice, State of California, and Council Member for the City of Yerba Linda, Farah Khan, Council Member for the City of Irvine, 
Dave Min, a UC Irvine law professor and candidate for California State Senate, District 37. Dr. Jose Moreno, council member, city of Anaheim. Shani Muslahi, candidate, Laguna Niguel City Council, along with Stephanie Olgo, candidate, Laguna Niguel City Council. Barry Simon, president, United Nations Association of the USA, Southern California Division and Regional Representative to the UNA USA National Council. Isabel Tridel, who's president to the United Nations Association in Orange County. I sit on their board also. Dr. Melissa Withers, our board member at Global Hill 365, and associate professor, USC Keck School of Medicine, USC Institute on Equalities in Global Health, and director of APRU Global Health Program. We will be providing you today with an opportunity to get involved to ending child marriage and get involved in the ending child marriage campaign. We have specific actions that where we will make a real impact. The topic we're going to explore requires some energy. It also requires dedication. So please take a deep breath and be present. A reminder that we will be sending you the slides and the recording, so listen and engage. And in preparation for this meeting, I already did some homework. We thank the offices of Senator uh, John Moorlock for confirming our appointment on September 3rd, and Senator Tom Umberg uh, confirming our appointment for September 4th. They will both be meeting with us along with other leaders in the community. Senator Morlock being my senator and Kari Petrie Norris, my assemblywoman, who we've heard from on the July 22nd uh, summit. She is solidly behind us. We thank her for her support, continued support. And now, is the time for our survival fireside chat and our speakers. We have with us Senator Joseph Dunn, who's currently the Assistant Dean for External Relations, as well as lecturer at the UCI School of Law. And I remember when I worked on your campaign and we distributed flower pots and, and, you, won, and you won that election. That was a privilege. Dr. Eleanor Cantley Gaitan, Director of Public Policy at the National Center on Sexual Exploitation. Jeannie Smoot, Senior Counsel for Policy and Strategy, Tahere Justice Center. Thank you all for being here with us and let's start that chat. Great, Rima, and I'm gonna add your name to the list of folks that are gonna be involved in this, in this chat, okay. So uh, big thanks to Global Hope 365 for um, taking a little risk here. Um, Paul and I are facilitators for a living and we love shaking up what we're used to and things in events like this. So um, we thought it may be a little um, more engaging to watch some people have a conversation about what they're passionate about instead of um, hearing a presentation. So that's really the spirit of this next activity together. But I'm gonna need everybody's help so there are a few protocols um, that all the rest of us um, need to pay close attention to. It's really simple, but this is how it works. So if you're not um, Senator Dunn, Dr. Eleanor, Ken uh, Dr. Dr. Gaetan, Jeannie, Smoot, or Rima, then I'm going to have you turn off your camera. Um, so it's really just a couple of us here. So turn off your camera, go on mute. And the reason we're asking you to do that is that it helps, it helps us focus. And I, what we're trying to do here is if we came up, upon these four experts having a cup of coffee together, um, talking about what's most important to them, and we were able just to like be a hidden camera in the corner or be a fly on the wall and just listen in, that's the kind of atmosphere we're going for today. And so um, you, can, you can put on speaker view for this one. You, that way you can hear what everybody is saying as they say it. But we're really the invitation for the four of you is to have a, a conversation with one another, um, some candor, some, some warmth with one another. Um, and it's not monologuing and it's not presenting, but it's truly a conversation among colleagues who have a shared passion and a shared expertise. And what I'll do is I will facilitate. So I'm gonna ask some questions 
um, to kind of get the conversation started. And even on Zoom, it's sometimes hard to tell like who's, whose turn it is it to talk. You know, we can't really do the eye contact thing super well. So you may have to say, and we may have to invite each other into the conversation. You know, we may have to say, you know, um, Jeannie, I know you know a lot about this. Do you want to comment next? Or, you know, Joseph, would, are you up for commenting? You know, we have to kind of pass the mic along one, with one another as well. So call him Joe. For, let's call him Joe. Okay. <laughs> exactly, Reba. <laughs> All right. Great. So um, to get us started, and the, the four of you guys can also uh, look at the chat, um, so you've got that question, but I just want to get us started. This question is, you know, what do you think are the most important things to know about the current state of child marriage law in California? I, you, you all are you all are experts. You probably think there's a lot of important things to know, and it's really hard to break it down to just a few items. But, you know, if if you were standing in line at the grocery store and someone asked you, what do you, what's important to you in the world, and you only had two minutes to tell them, what would you say? So let's chat about that as um, as a group. What what are the most important things to know? Um, so this is Jeannie from Tahrey, mm -hmm. and I think one of the first things, of course, to make sure everyone understands is that there's no age floor. There's no statutory lower limit to how young a child can be married so long as there's parental consent and judicial approval. And that puts California in the minority and the shrinking minority of states across the country that have since 2016 been moving up, 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 right? Um, so uh, the bottom line message is that California can do much more to protect very vulnerable children from possibly irreparable lifelong harm. Um, and not just with respect to that age four, obviously we wanna see 18 no exceptions, but the efforts that were made, the law that was passed, even itself contains some exceptions, some qualifiers that mean that not everyone, uh, not all minors even get the benefit of the uh, few safeguards that it put in place. So I think just communicating that lack of an age floor and so much room still that a vulnerable person could be put at risk is, is really uh, what most essentially has to come across. Building on what Jeannie said, it's important to identify harm. Public policy is, is a, it are proposals about problems. And so we have to say the lack of a minimum age on child marriage is causing harm. And there are real victims of the power imbalance that is at the heart of this socially accepted arrangement. Uh, so basically, as we know, uh, UNICEF indicated that child marriage is human rights abuse. It's a fundamental violation of human rights. The State Department issued a report in 2016 indicating it's a violation of human rights in other countries and we're saying, what about us? What about our kids? We need to take care of our own backyard before we start pointing the fingers and policing the world. And as you know, uh, as I mentioned, that when a child uh, gets married early, it uh, compromises the girl's development, especially when it's to adult men. And so it results in early pregnancy, which results in early, it's isolation, social isolation. And then it interrupts their schooling. It interrupts their training. They will not be able to have a career or vocational advancement or take care of themselves, which brings to mind the case of Sherry Johnson. And that's how I knew initially that child marriage was still legal in the US. Uh, it was an article written by Nicholas Kristof for the New York Times. And the title kind was really a grabbing, uh, my, grabbed my attention, it said, 11 pregnant and forced to marry her rapist. So Sherry Johnson was a child of 10. She was repeatedly raped by a deacon and a parishioner in her church. She got pregnant at 11. Uh, child welfare was going to conduct an investigation. And then the church and the parents got together and they married her off to the 20 year old rapist. At 18, she found a friendly attorney who got her a divorce. And she couldn't, she did not, so you can imagine 11 to 18, seven kids. 
but she'd not continue to play the, the victim. And that's why we call them the survivors. They survived that ordeal that will stay with them for the rest of their lives. But she advocated at the Florida legislator because she didn't want other kids to go what she went through. And so with her advocacy and other organizations that were involved, they were able to raise, uh, to change legislation to, to raise the minimum age to 17. So this is what we need to think about. In addition, uh, marrying at such an age with an age differential, it increases the risk of domestic violence. And as I mentioned, maternal and infant mortality. And we have a high rate of maternal and infant mortality in the US. And as we heard also 80% end up in divorce. And so we need to think that it's not about how many do we have in California, but how can we prevent future victims? How can we prevent minors and children from going through that trauma and having it with them for the, and suffering from it for the rest of their lives? And uh, Rima, I think that all of that is so important to convey. And um, I was limiting my remarks to uh, the person in the grocery store, right? Um, so <laughs> just to, to, because this is a fishbowl exercise, I think I was um, trying to stick to the, 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 the question. And some of it, though, leads to this other, you know, the kind of advocacy 101s, sort of know your audience. There's a strategic and then tactical and then on principle thing here, right? So mm -hmm. on principle, um, you want to build um, good relationships and you want to um, have people see you as a trusted resource on this issue and follow up with you. And, and so one of the things that I might do in the grocery store to continue the conversation or as I've waylaid people in the past on airplanes um, has been to ask more about them, mm. to ask how they might intersect with or come to the issue or what groups they might belong to that I can enlist and conscript, right? Um, so I think there's a way in which you kind of put forth some of these facts, put forth one or another uh, of these storylines, or, you know, you may have seen an article in the New York Times, maybe you were as shocked as I was to see that this happens um, and the harms that can happen as a result of it, that it's not just over there somewhere, but it's right here at home, it's still happening and it has these devastating results, right? Um, but so definitely, though, part of what you do is you size up your audience. And if you are speaking with a legislator, for example, you might pre-research them, right? You might, in fact, I always do. It's just been uh, easier to do that in recent years with all the information on the internet. And um, while you can't do this necessarily with the random connection you make in the community, um, and so you have to ask those probing questions at the outset, you can find out, for example, if the legislator that you're going to speak with, and not for tonight's actions, as I understand, these are already teed up and forms and templates already. So these are light touches to begin with. But when you follow up with the legislator, make sure that you've done your homework, not only on those kinds of stats and stories that Rima mentioned, and make sure to not just include those stats that are compelling and to drill down on certain ones of them, but also to elevate the stories that just drive it home. But find out about them. Did they chair a statewide task force? Are they the chair of a relevant committee? Um, do they sit on the board of a domestic violence shelter? What's their professional background? Are they a teacher, a lawyer, a doctor, an OBGYN? You know, are they, do they come from a social work background? All of those are different ways that you can have avenues of approach to them and ways where you can go deeper on the facts and the stories and the dynamics that will matter most to them and move them most to action and also show them how they can have a particular leadership role with respect to that issue. So if they're an educator, talk about that way that, you know, the child marriage interrupts education. Um, acknowledge their leadership, enlist them in it. Uh, you know, are they deeply religious? You should know that too. Uh, you should know if they uh, are concerned about, you know, teen pregnancy. And then if that's the case, uh, make sure that you kind of meet them where they are if you can, right? So uh, make sure uh, to frame, you know, advocating against uh, child marriage as not an anti-marriage stance. In fact, it's about ensuring that those individuals who do marry are choosing to do so of their own free will that uh, it's enabling those marriages to be built on healthier, uh, more durable, stronger foundations, if that is their choice. And so you can actually 
see that common ground shape up if you know more about where they're coming from and how that intersects with the reasons you care as well. Mm -hmm. Hey, Rima. I, I mean, Joe, get in there. That's what I was going to say next. <laughs> uh, uh, I think, uh, thank you very much. Uh, yeah. um, uh, great comments uh, by our last uh, uh, speaker. Uh, I want to give a different perspective for everyone, having sat inside the legislature. Uh, and uh, I hate to tell you, Rima, how many years ago it was that we delivered those flower pots. And, and by the way, it was Ray Cordova who chaired our uh, gathering at the Disneyland Hotel in uh, November of 1998. So Ray, great to see you. Um, the, the view from a legislator is more complicated. Um, and I just want to give you what I always put into my speeches about a day in the life of a legislator, uh, ignoring these crazy COVID times. Um, you have many advocacy groups meeting with you every single day. Uh, and literally by the end of the day, you can't remember who you met through most of the day. It's what I call the schooling fish problem. Um, and the real secret to advocacy in a legislative body is how you separate our fish, so to speak, from the school of fish. Um, and that takes some unique insight. All of the things that, that the prior speaker had identified are correct. You have to establish relationships, particularly in the districts. All of that is very, very important. But the merits of an issue in a legislative body are only one piece on what, in essence, is a five-layer chess game. The merits only count for a bit, and sadly, not that much. Um, it's all the other pieces on the five layer chessboard that will get us to success on this issue. And I think all of us on this call know that there are very strong advocacy groups, both on the right end of the political spectrum, on the left end of the political spectrum, uh, that oppose uh, trying to put limits or even outright ban on child marriages for their own various reasons from civil libertarian organizations to very religious organizations, all of them have their reason that they think is meritorious. And they will go visit the legislators too on this issue. Um, and so it's how do we separate it? And I, I just wanna share one real life example that Rima is well aware of. Um, uh, I and one of my business partners in DC, uh, we have been behind the state legislative efforts around the country to open up the civil statute limitations for childhood sexual abuse, uh, where the abuse occurred many years before because as most of us know on this call, survivors of childhood sexual abuse generally do not come forward with their uh, experience until about four, eight the age of 40 and above. Uh, 20 and 30 year olds generally do not raise this. They're not repressed memory cases. They always remember what happened to them. And the damage to them is, is extensive. Rima identified some. I wanna add another one, Rima, is neuroscience now can actually document the subtle brain damage that occurs when a child is sexually abused. Child isn't ready physically, mature wise, et cetera. And that causes brain damage similar to PTSD for uh, someone who served in the military. Um, stem cells is being viewed as the place that that damage can be corrected, but we're only on the early stages of that. Um, but the, in the, child, in the um, uh, child sexual abuse civil statute limitations issue, we adopted a very specific strategy in the four, we opened up four states, New York, New Jersey, Arizona, and California last year. Uh, and that's why you see all those cases coming forward now. And our strategy, and it's gonna sound cynical, everybody, my apologies, but uh, you gotta take the legislative bodies uh, in a real world context and kind of force your issue through. We basically knew because there were powerful forces, the insurance industry and others on the other side, we had to raise in the minds of the legislator the, that the fear of a no vote was uh, higher than the fear of a yes vote. So what I mean by that is on childhood sexual abuse, civil statute limitations, obviously the Catholic Church, church I was raised in, is often a targeted civil defendant in those cases because of the cover up of abuse in that church. But the church is very influential in a lot of state legislatures. Uh, and a lot of legislatures did not want to vote yes on the bill for fear that their community back home in the district would uh, be upset, uh, particularly in heavily Catholic communities uh, as an example. So if we can raise the fear of, the, of a no vote to be higher than their fear of a yes vote, 
regardless what the merits are, we win. Um, and so we came right out of the box and just did some minor social media questions to some vulnerable legislators and just said, are, are you gonna support children or predators? Let us know your position on Senate Bill XYZ. Well, you can imagine no legislator wants to be viewed as someone who protects predators or children. And so these vulnerable uh, folks who were in a, a re-election campaign immediately published a statement that they were gonna support the bill. Um, we did that quite deliberately. They were kind of weak deers at the back of the herd, but it showed to every other legislator, if you're gonna vote no on our bill, we're coming into your district and tell your constituents that you prefer to protect predators of children than children themselves. For the first, we've been fighting this fight for 37 years actually, sadly, but uh, in California for the first time, we had unanimous votes in both houses. All Republicans, all Democrats uh, voted for that bill. Close to that in New Jersey and uh, New York, uh, it was a dogfight extraordinaire in Arizona, but we got it out to the governor's office and he signed. So I share this with everybody that we, we are naturally, as rational humans, we want to go to places like Sacramento and argue the merits of the issue. But the merits by themselves won't carry the day. They're an important piece on the chessboard, but they're only one of many pieces on that chessboard. And so to win this issue, in my view, in a place like Sacramento, the importance really is we have to develop a rather simple strategy on that fear, fear of a no vote being higher than a yes vote, despite the pressure they get from ad advocacy groups on both ends of the political spectrum on the issue of ch child marriage. So let me stop there and uh, just wanted to share some thoughts. Thanks, thanks Joe, really, um, really poignant. Appreciate you uh, telling us some of the finer points and it's my job to keep the train running on time. So I'm gonna um, say, let's give um, our fish and the panelists um, the virtual applause. You can give us, wave your hands, give us some sparkle fingers, but it, um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna end that here, um, but really appreciate hearing from, from each of you. And I hope I captured, I, I know you guys are a wealth of information and um, Jeannie, I appreciate you taking the grocery store line, airplane, getting off the airplane metaphor, because um, sometimes that's all we have, you know, and what are you going to do with that, that limited time? Um, so I'm going to nudge us forward into um, Let me this add. next part. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Rima. No, go ahead. I'm just going to nudge us into our, the next section where we're going to do breakouts. Yeah? Okay. Okay, so let so, me... We're going into the, the breakout. Let me just add one thing. Mm -hmm. um, basically, when, when I uh, set up the appointment, I have the luxury of having ran for office and being in elected office within the political party structure. So I, I know how this works. And when I asked for those meetings with uh, one of the senators, I took with me a community of leaders in their own district, letting them know that these leaders are all for ending child marriage and they would like to meet with you on the topic. So mm -hmm. that helps that they know you're not the lone ranger there. So uh, that's why we'd like to know which district you're in. Uh, so we can take you with us to those meetings or when you set up an appointment with your elected officials, then we can find out who from these community leaders and other elected officials that have partnered with us at the California Coalition to End Child Marriage that will come with you to that meeting. In addition you, to the resolutions and the other things we're doing. Thank you. Okay, let me tell you everybody a little bit about what's gonna happen next. We're, we're really excited about this part um, because this is where we all can can um, really back up what we believe in and, uh, and take some action. And hopefully, as Joe said, um, at the end of the day, that some of these folks um, who are our representatives and lawmakers may actually, this our issue might rise to the top. They may remember it a little bit better. So what we wanna support now is we're gonna break out into some smaller groups and we have an advocacy toolkit. And so the folks at Global Hope 365 have put together um, the kind of a digital toolkit. So what you all need to do now is click on that link 
and open it up right now and, and take a look at it. And this is really gonna be your guide um, to taking advocacy. And so there's a, a lot of different activities in there and we're gonna go into small groups and we've got um, some folks leading these small groups. So I'm gonna put their names um, also in the chat so you can kind of see um, who's, who's here to support us and who's, who's the leader in your group. Those folks have um, some little symbols by their names as well. So we're gonna break out into small groups and Zoom does this really cool thing where Paul's gonna put us into small groups and we'll be, I see you Raymond, I'll answer your question in a second. Um, where we can be on this call still, but kind of in a smaller space where there's fewer people and we can turn on our cameras and we can talk about where we're from and we can say hi to each other. And then we can kind of roll up our sleeves and, and try out some of these advocacy actions together. So we're gonna give um, a pretty generous chunk of time right now because we really want us to, to move some things forward. So we're gonna take about 40 minutes right now in order to do that. And when, when there's about eight minutes left, you'll get a, you'll get a warning from Paul um, and you'll use the, the rest of that time and then we'll all come back together to, to close up our time together. Any um, instructions from you, Paul? Any comments that I missed? I don't see Paul. No, He's probably I think nodding we're, I think we're, oh, I think we're good. <laughs> I had to turn my camera and my microphone back on. Okay. <laughs> Awesome. Thanks. And Raymond, what's your question? Where is the link? Where, where do I click on the link? Where do you click on the link? Okay. If you go to the bottom of your Zoom, there should be a bubble that says chat. If you open that up, there's lots of links and information there. Okay. And if you still can't find it, don't worry. Once you get into that small group, someone can help you out. Okay. Thank mm -hmm. you. Okay. Okay. I think we're ready to roll. And I also wanted to remind people that we do have meetings set up with Senator Tom Umberg and Senator John Morlock. Rima, what is that? Um, the implication of that is that if that is uh, your senator, should you still call and request a meeting, or should you just say call and support? Say we support the end of child marriage, and no need to request a meeting. No, you basically call and say you support uh, ending child marriage and don't request a meeting because we already have one set up. Right. Okay, has everybody got that? Oh. I'll add it to the, to the document. Okay. And um, I hope that you all got a little bit of a, a spark and you got some, um, got some real work done. I hope that it was a satisfying experience. And also I hope that if, um, now that you've got the advocacy toolkit and those hashtags that you can put some, a note in your calendar to, to give it a try um, throughout the week and keep that advocacy up. So we're going to start to turn the corner towards, towards wrapping up today. And we've got some asks of you. But before I do that, um, any, any comments from Rima or other folks from Global Hope? Okay. Rima is talking, but muted. We talk, that's what I thought might be happening. I didn't think Rima had nothing to say. <laughs> Where is she? There she is. <laughs> Basically, what I'm hoping is while I'm talking, if you can post that survey, mm -hmm. because we didn't have it in our list. And so we were not able to, to get to it. So if we can, um, and the poll. then, yeah, not, uh, not just the poll, but the survey, the Google form survey, mm -hmm. which is, mm -hmm. have you done all these activities in the, so, um, Anna maybe can post those links. I thought it was in the storyboard. I'm gonna ask, I'm gonna have Anna can, post those. Okay, unless you have it, Paul. Nope, Anna's got it. She just posted okay. it. Great. Okay, so, um, well, welcome back everyone. Uh, how was it? Was it fun? Yeah? Okay, okay. So uh, don't forget to complete the Google Form survey. 
So in ending, what I would like you to do is support Global Hope 365 and our current initiative. We've uh, gone through the digital campaign. We did that during the breakout session. Um, we also uh, shared it on Facebook, shared it on Twitter. You can also share it with five of your friends. So please do that. This is the more letters we send to our elected officials, the better. Uh, we also have a resolution that we authored. It's a non-binding resolution uh, and that can be taken uh, to city council and county supervisorial boards and you can ask them to pass it for us. And so far, uh, we, it's being, uh, it will be heard at the County of Orange. Um, uh, Supervisor Doc Shafee and Michelle Steele are taking the lead on that. Uh, the city of Fullerton, Irvine, which uh, that came out of the pre-meeting we had on Monday. Both council members Farah Khan uh, indicated that she will uh, submit it there. And so both Farah Khan and council member Melissa Fox, who are both uh, partners with us at the California Coalition, they already sent the memo to city manager in Irvine. It's going to be on the docket for August 11th. So wish them luck. But if you live in Irvine, you need to call the other city council members. And I know Kristen Manna, our board member, is taking the lead on that one, also contacting the other three council members. So if you live in Irvine, call the other three council members and ask them to vote yes on that. Um, in Mission Viejo, Greg Rath is taking the lead on that. Newport Beach, uh, Diane Dixon, uh, Tustin, and of course your Belinda, our own Peggy Wang is taking the lead on that. And she's also a partner in the California Coalition to End Child Marriage. And again, please consider to donating to fund our ongoing programs, campaigns to raise awareness and save lives by ending child marriage and human trafficking. The link is in the chat again. And Kristen Mana, our board member and director of development is there to help you. Uh, you could do it monthly, you could do lump sum, and she's there to answer any of your questions. So talk to her uh, in the pro or private message her in the chat. We have also partnered, um, partnered with another nonprofit called the Three Strands Foundation. And uh, to provide the human trafficking prevention programs in all schools in Orange County. The Three Strands is providing that program in 48 out of the 58 counties in California. Neither Orange nor LA is one of them. And Global Hope is about preventing future victims of child marriage and human trafficking, starting with our county and then going to neighbor, neighboring counties. That program has been uh, in all public schools in San Diego through the effort of the district attorney and a grant from the UBS Foundation. So hopefully we can partner with some corporations or organizations in Orange County in order to save lives and prevent victims of human trafficking. And I would like you to post your experience on social media uh, with the hashtag and child marriage and uh, global hope and tag us at global hope 365. And I will ask you to contemplate what is your next move? Can we do it right now? Can we take the advice that Senator Joe Dunn gave us that we make them uh, in fear more of the no answer in order to get them to vote yes on it. And thank you for being present and attentive. We're all in ending, we're all about prevention, preventing future victims of child marriage and human trafficking. And thank you all for attending and participating today. But please fill out the survey. We would like to know how much which uh, we how much we accomplish whether you are able to get an appointment with your elected officials and so on and so forth thanks rima appreciate it okay paul and i are gonna um we have a couple more things we want from you and then we'll we'll say goodbye um so uh, liza liza has a friend who wrote a song that was uh she was really inspired um by this issue and we want to give you the experience of that song by um, playing it for you and also showing you the lyrics. But once we start playing the song, it'll be hard to, to talk. 
Um, so let me tell you the, the last thing that we are going to invite you to do. And if you were here at our last meeting, it will be familiar. So we're asking you now to pause and um, just think about what we just did, what you learned and how you're feeling. And we'd love a checkout from each of you. And what I mean by a checkout is um, think of three words and type those three words in the chat as kind of your, your checkout, your ticket out the door, your wave goodbye, and as a way to close um, our time together. So just three words and we'll fill up the chat with our three words. Um, and before you do that, let me post the lyrics to this song um, so that um, we can also experience the song that way. And Liza, any, any quick comments about the song or any introduction to it before we Yeah, this it? is written by Kristen Lee, and she attended the summit and was so moved by it that she wrote a song about the survivor stories. And we were just so incredibly moved by hearing it that we wanted to share it with all of you. And, and just to remind everyone, please fill out that survey. Anna, if you can post that link again to the surveys, because now we have the lyrics there. So if you can post the link to the surveys again, please. And uh, thank you so much. So we, can, we need those surveys back. So if you could do that while you're listening to the song. And thank you, Kristen Lee and Elizabeth Sitton and everyone else. All right. All right. So we'll listen to that song. We'll fill out the survey and we'll put our three word checkout um, as a way to wrap up our time together. Just 13 and old enough to wear, said the California court, so she signed her life away. The neighbor's sister, she felt they didn't care. Marry me, said he, I'll keep you safe. So she plunged into nightmare. If I begin to weep, she said, I never will stop weeping. My life could be sweet. Freedom is working Thank you. Goodbye, everybody. Thank you. Well done. Thank you so much. Thank we you all for being here. Yes. Oh, that's pretty on time. Pretty good. Uh, actually, we wanted to talk about our um, upcoming event, which is the coffee meetup. And if you can post the link, Anna, for the people who are still here, uh, the slides somehow, the PowerPoint presentation or the Google slide were not running. So um, please post the link to the coffee meetup with Adela Estrada, who's the CSEC uh, steering committee chair. That's the Commercially Sexually Exploited Children for LA County. And that's August 22nd. 
So thank you for posting that. And United Nations Association Orange County Chapter has today at 5 p.m. A, a UNA Women Meeting at 5 p.m. And there's a link there so you can jump from our meeting to theirs. So if you can post that link into the um, mm -hmm. into the chat. Or Diana, if you're still there, Diana, you can post the link into the chat. And in November for the coffee meetup, we have the district attorney from San Diego, Samar Stefan, who rolled out that human trafficking prevention program. So basically follow us on Twitter. Um, we'll send you, since you're on our email list, we're going to send you information about these upcoming events. And please tell our fr your friends about us. And I used to do 10 to 12 speaking engagements a month in person. I still do them digitally, virtually, whatever you want to call it. So let me know if you have a group, an organization at your house of worship. And we can still do that because we want to continue raising awareness and saving lives. And for Farah Khan and Melissa Fox, hopefully the first resolution that will be passed will be from the city of Irvine, who always takes the lead. I know you passed the resolution, uh, the peace resolution. Um, and so we're hoping that you'll be the first city to pass such a resolution. Oh, Isabel is here. Isabel, can you post the link to the event at 5 p.m.? Yes, I'm gonna do it now. Yes, so this way 